So that's a wetland near uh, my house here where I saw about a thousand cackling geese come in this big uh, sort of backwards tornado down into, uh, down into a little pond. So that was fun just to in enjoy being in the middle of some wildlife. All right. So I'll remind you that we are at the end of our program here. So if you look back at the handout that we uh, connected with earlier, Ooh, got a little audio feedback. We can expect a little bit of that today. I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. So we started with um, a month ago, sort of us all being together on a live session. And then we had some homework to do over the last couple weeks. And now we're at our last session here. So right now we're going to talk about Arizona and Nevada pretty specifically. And we think that that will apply to some other people. I know we had people uh, on from New Mexico, from Texas, from places like that. I think this is the right session to tune into. But if you are an arborist who works basically exclusively in either California or Hawaii, maybe um, you are not so interested in this hour and you should close out and go do something else for an hour and come back at noon for California or 1 p.m. for Hawaii. You're more than welcome to stay on for the full sort of uh, three hour session uh, that we have here today but um, just giving you that opportunity right now. Today is a little bit different than last time we were together. Your screen should again look something sort of like this, but down in these audio video controls, you can turn on your videos and your microphones. This is meeting settings, not um, what would we call it, uh, webinar settings. And so what we'll ask is that you keep your video off and your microphone off. And if we get any feedback like we had before, Ryan and I will try to uh, mute people. And that when you have a question or you want to tell a story, you then turn on your audio and video, your microphone and your video, and we will see your video come up and call on you and say, okay, why don't you ask, ask your question at this point? And I've done this enough that I know that many of you will have a five to eight minute rambling story about something loosely related to what we're talking about. So we will reserve the authority to mute you and cut off your story and keep moving if, if that needs to be. But often we hear really great stories in these sorts of sessions. So please share with us and ask us questions. The majority of today's time is going to be about hearing from you all and what you want to talk about. We no longer have a question answer. Um, option button. We have a chat button so you can still write your questions in the chat. Cara Donahue is also on this and she's going to do a little presentation and also answer whatever questions you all have uh, that are more sort of avian biologist oriented. So what we're going to talk about today, our schedule is we're going to review some key points that we covered last time and in the videos that you all watched. Then Cara is going to give us a little bit of a dive into the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the M opinion, and the incidental take permits. Hopefully, you all listened to some of the videos, especially Special Agent Chavez's video, where he talked about these in more depth so that you know what these are. But if not, we'll sort of be able to introduce them again, and you won't be totally lost, hopefully, uh, when we go through this. Then we'll pick it back up, continue our review, look at some of the pre-work inspection homework, but the majority of um, what we're doing right now is discussion, question and answer period, stuff like that. Okay, so let's do a little bit of review from before. So we can go to treecareforbirds.com and download the newest version of our best management practices. In there, we have definitions of wildlife trained arborists and our goal for these sessions for this month long course is for you all to have the knowledge and tools to function as a wildlife trained arborist. You may need quite a bit more experience and practice and other things to really feel comfortable or get into that role, but let's start working on that and let's figure out what else you all need to be able to function in that role. If you look at the best management practices, it starts off very broad talking about you know sort of at the maybe us level what what can we go about doing and then on page 48 it starts focusing on arizona <clears throat> and on page 64 we have an appendix about nevada and that we sort of think that the arizona and nevada regions are similar enough that they we group them together in a similar sort of approach and we'll talk about some of the differences but you can see compared to Hawaii 
Arizona and Nevada are much more similar than, uh, than the other states that we're dealing with. <clears throat> when we think about Arizona and Nevada, I think we often think about hot, arid climates and that that might be sort of the biggest difference in dealing with those states versus the other states in the Western chapter. But another big difference is the legal structure, right? So last time we talked about the Eagle Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Arizona and Nevada have their own wildlife laws as well. Every state does. And so in Nevada, there's NRS 503-610 there. It just rolls off the tongue, right? Then we have um, Arizona and Nevada laws that are pretty similar to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. In these states, in both Arizona and Nevada, we feel that the state laws are very similar to the federal laws or less restrictive than the federal laws. And so if we focus on the federal laws, I think that we're understanding our requirements enough and that we're gonna focus on just sort of the federal level laws in these regions. Whereas in California and Hawaii, the state laws are really very important to understand. So we'd focus on those maybe a little more. Now, every, uh, there are many sort of local level regulations to be aware of as well. And the one that we highlight in the best management practices in Nevada and California is the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency has its own code of ordinances, which actually lists, what would I call it, uh, lists um, buffer distances for osprey and other um, birds of prey that we see in the Lake Tahoe region. So just know if you work in the Lake Tahoe region, check out the TRPA um, code of ordinances. But wherever you work, there may be local ordinances that we're not aware of and it would be important for you to know about. All right, so there have been some changes going on in the past uh, several years regarding Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So I figured we'd just give you guys some, some background on what's been going on and, and where we are at today. So um, historically, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services interpreted MBTA to protect birds from incidental take. And when we talk about incidental take, that's um, basically activities that are otherwise lawful, like you um, are trimming a tree uh, and you have any permits that you might need for trimming that tree, but you're, you're lawfully trimming a tree or you're um, building a, a, a transmission line or, or whatever it, activity it is that, that is a legal activity, uh, your, the birds are protected um, from any harm to them, from, from harm to their nests or to the birds themselves uh, from that activity. So Fish and Wildlife Service has always interpreted it that way, um, but there have been different circuit courts throughout the country that have ruled that it does protect birds from incidental take and others that don't, and it, it kind of falls half and half as far as how many uh, circuit courts rule one way or the other. Next slide. Um, so the last presidential administration- so uh, Birds confirmation. I don't know if, I'm not sure if there was a question there or that was an accidental unmuting, but yeah, someone um, me. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, so the, the previous administration had um, produced what's called a solicitor's opinion. So the, the lawyer basically for that administration, the solicitor um, had, had released a solicitor's opinion on MBTA that it does not protect birds from incidental take. And they also uh, went through the process of trying to codify that, that solicitor's opinion in the Federal Register um, with a final rule that had that language in it, that birds um, were not protected from incidental take. Uh, that rule was supposed to go into effect um, this year when the new administration came in. And so when a new administration comes in, they have the opportunity to uh, pause some of that stuff from taking effect uh, while they review it. And so um, that's, that's what happened when the Biden administration came in. Uh, they withdrew the solicitor's opinion, which is a very simple process that, that happens from administration to administration. Um, so the solicitor's opinion was withdrawn. Um, you may have also heard it referred to as the M opinion. Um, 
So they, they cited a, a circuit court ruling that had happened when there had been some legal action taken against the previous, um, uh, that previous solicitor's opinion. Um, they cited that and they also delayed the effective date for that, that final rule that would have codified the, the um, solicitor's opinion. So I know that's a lot of like legal stuff and ultimately you don't, you won't need to remember any of this, um, but you might just be interested in case you're, you've heard some of this st stuff going on and you're just not that familiar with it. Uh, next slide. Uh, all right, so then in October, we had Fish and Wildlife Service uh, officially revoke that final rule and returned to the interpretation of, of MBTA, protecting birds from incidental take, and basically saying that it will be um, an uh, enforcement discretion situation again, because there is no permit that you can get for take under MBTA uh, for incidental take. So. Um, back to enforcement discretion, uh, a, a law enforcement agent could decide that they want to pursue prosecuting you or not. Um, so kind of uncertain times back, back in place. Uh, but at the same time, they also um, published a notice of proposed rulemaking in the Federal Register and a notice of intent to develop a permit program for incidental take. Uh, that comment period ends tomorrow. Um, so certainly lots of um, NGOs, lots of people from the public, lots of industry people are commenting on, um, on this proposed rule. Uh, next slide. And so their Fish and Wildlife Service is basically considering three different types of incidental take in their in their rule in their proposed rulemaking. The first one is exceptions, which would be uh, basically you know a homeowner is doing some landscaping work in their backyard and they disturb a nest. There, that's an exception to uh, incidental take. Um, or you're driving your car down the highway and you hit a bird, um, completely accidental, nothing you could have done to prevent that. that those types of things would be exceptions. Um, general permits would be permits um, that are focused on different types of industries um, like uh, generation, wind, solar, or the industry that I work for, electric utilities, um, oil and gas. There's, there's a bunch of different industries that are being considered for general permits where there would be um, some basic like guidance, but best management practices that a, that a company needs to have in place and they could apply to take part in the general permit and there'd probably be some reporting requirements and things like that, but there wouldn't be a really extensive lengthy, lengthy uh, process for, for getting coverage under that permit. Uh, for anybody that's familiar with um, the nationwide permits for waters, um, that's it's similar to that permit program. And then the last one would be individual permits for projects that perhaps have larger impacts uh, to a sensitive area or um, it's a one time action. So they wouldn't maybe want to uh, cover all of their maintenance, their O&M type activities under a gen general permit. They could get uh, an individual permit, which would take more environmental review and, and more, more time to go through an oversight from Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, they're requesting from the public uh, comments on this, um, information about what types of, of permits people would like to see and how those permits should um, should look, et cetera. And they'll, they'll review all those public comments, perform an environmental review, hopefully develop a permit program, um, and, and that would then be published as a final rule in the Federal Register. Uh, time frame on this. Um, I, I guess I would say it's hard to say. <laughs> Federal government, things tend to move slowly. Um, so I wouldn't expect us to be likely to see anything for, for quite some time, but hopefully uh, for any industries that are going to be directly impacted by this, the Fish and Wildlife Service will be reaching out to those industries to discuss with them the, the setting up that general permit for their industry. 
That's Great. It. So thanks, Carl. Why don't you stick around for just a second? I'm going to try to give some key points from, from what I understand and give some people some, some advice about what, what sort of videos are tune, tune into from previous if they want to explore this a little deeper. So if you're in somewhere like California, there are pretty strict environmental laws besides the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So I'm not sure this has really affected you very much, but for everyone else outside of California, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is sort of the big law that we need to worry about navigating. Also the Endangered Species Act and the Eagle Act, but Migratory Bird Treaty Act, we're probably bumping into much more often than the other two. Last year, we had said that there was this new thing, this M opinion about, hey, maybe the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is going to be enforced very differently and we should be ready for that. And that now we're saying, hey, it looks like that has been taken away. We, we sort of predicted that that was going to happen last year. And that our best management practices are really set up with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in mind. And so understanding this law is important. But if you try to follow our best management practices, maybe understanding the details of this isn't that important. We're going to do our best to not impact nesting wildlife or while we're out there doing tree care. And we're giving you some tools to do that. Does that, does that sound like a pretty good summary card? Anything important to sort of jam in there? Nope, that sounds good. Cool. We'll definitely check out some of our videos from last year. Special Agent Chavez was really generous with his time last year and joined us for like talking really specifically about the M opinion. So I, I recommend checking that one out for sure. And then um, lo lots of videos out there to watch that are all available to you through the handout. <clears throat> okay, so we've covered enough about laws. So when you go into the best management practices, you know, what really um, the steps that we really highlight are first thing to do is to find some contact information for a wildlife biologist and a wildlife rehabilitation center. So we are building lists of wildlife biologists in the Tree Care for Birds website. And then each state has its own list of wildlife rehabilitation centers. So you can see this interactive map in Arizona. There are a lot of wildlife rehabilitation centers in Arizona. Um, and that I saw generally, so I, I went through uh, most of the homeworks that I got in, and most of them had left the wildlife biologist and wildlife rehabilitation re rehabilitator blank. And that this is something that I'd really like to encourage you all to try to find these before you have an emergency, before you really need it, because that um, it's really hard in emergencies to, to find someone right away. And so a uh, great job by this person in blue ink here. Looks like they are in the Santa Barbara area uh, for finding a wildlife biologist and a wildlife rehabilitator in these areas. And so one thing I'll mention is that, uh, maybe I have a slide about this later, but that Arizona seems to have many more wildlife rehabilitators than Nevada. And that can actually change how we approach wildlife emergencies. So let, let's see if we have more about that. Otherwise we can dig into to that a little, a little more a little later. The next steps in the best management practice are to think a little bit more about what is your um, breeding season, what is your main nesting season and your habitat value, right? So these are in the sort of main parts of the best management practice. And uh, Cara, the next slide is another quiz question. So get, get ready for that. Um, and then we have uh, upper right, uh, low habitat value, bottom right, high habitat value, lower left, sensitive habitat value. And so being able to think about these can be important. The, I always get the Arizona name wrong. The Arizona Department of Game and Fish, something, something like that, gave us some suggestions that is based on elevation. So most arborists in Arizona, I believe work below 3000 feet uh, in the greater Phoenix area and places like that. <clears throat> in which case they recommend the main breeding season as the 15th of January to the 30th of June. So because we are in these hot arid regions, we generally expect an earlier breeding season. By the 30th of June, it is so hot that um, in these regions that uh, nesting at this point would be very difficult for these birds. If you're one of the other arborists who works sort of in the higher elevations, they've recommended some other breeding seasons that you might use in those and that this is um, really great information and it's too bad that not every wildlife agency gives us such detailed breeding season information like this. Um, so in Nevada, we have a different approach and what we've been told is that in Southern Nevada, we should use a March 1st to August 31st breeding season. 
and in northern Nevada, an April 1st to August 31st breeding season. I'll point out that for all of these, these are just sort of general ideas. You're gonna have breeding happening outside of these time periods. But what we wanna do is we wanna focus our energies into these sort of breeding seasons, um, doing, you know, being very careful during those seasons. And then we can sort of spread out and, and move a little bit more quickly during the other times. And so just, just know that we have some recommendations in the best management practices for breeding seasons in your area but yours might be different if you work in a very specific area, you might wanna spend some time researching that. <clears throat> we also gave you some examples of what may be uh, low in the upper right and high in the bottom right and sensitive in the, low, in the lower left. Habitats might look like in these more arid regions, uh, just to give you examples that are maybe illustrative of your example, of your individual area and maybe not, right? Maybe you'll have to uh, find different area, uh, different examples for your area and say this, you know, desert scrub here or this riparian river channel really um, don't represent my area. You know, this is how I'm going to think about habitat value in my area. It's hard to be specific enough for all these different regions that the best management practices are covering. But we bring together the breeding season and the habitat value to give us an idea of what um, what level of training might be appropriate for um, working in these different areas at these different times. And so this is an example for uh, the Phoenix area, right? We're using the breeding seasons that are, um, that the Arizona Department of, Fishing, of Game and Fish gave us. And, um, <clears throat> and then we use those habit, habitat values across. So basically we're trying to identify our high value habitat work during the breeding season and say, hey, can we schedule that in the non-breeding season so that we have enough training to do that work in that area? Or do we need to think about involving a wildlife biologist? And that's gonna be sort of our biggest question and what we're most going to sort of be thinking about as we are trained uh, wildlife trained arborists here on this workshop, we're gonna to wanna to know when we're working in areas sort of with uh, too much risk for us to handle and we need to either bring in an expert or schedule it for a time so that we are, will be more comfortable with it. So there's lots of different resources out there for how to determine whether your area might be sensitive. So riparian areas seem to be very important. And then there's lots of other habitats, critical habitats and different things that we might wanna be, keep an eye out for. And so a new tool that I believe was just created to help us figure this out is the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency's Crucial Habitat Assessment Tool, where you can sort of zoom into different areas and see what sort of habitats and what sort of habitat values um, are present on the site that you're going to be working at to try to figure out if you're gonna have any sensitive habitats out there. <sighs> All right, so once we've finished sort of our desktop review, we're pretty comfortable about you know, we're sending someone out there with enough training to do our pre-work inspection. We wanna do our pre-work inspection. And you all went out there and experimented with it. And I'm interested in hearing how it went for you, but let's go through a couple of them. And Cara and I can just sort of discuss what she is um, seeing with these and what um, provide a little bit of discussion for us about, about how these went for people. So the first one is in Dallas, Texas, I believe. We are pruning a crepe myrtle away from a building. And we have um, determined that it's low habitat value during the non-breeding season, which in our structure means that it's category one. So anyone can go and do this work. We have found a little bit of whitewash or feces on the ground. And that since it's the non-breeding season, we um, can go ahead and do this work. No, no advice given, no, no action needed. Carl, what do you think? I totally agree. This looks, looks great. Perfect. Well, well, well yeah. done, person in, in Dallas, Texas. Okay, we appear to have an olive in someone's backyard little patio area with low habitat value, and they didn't find anything. We have a wildlife rehabilitator in case of emergency with a phone number at the bottom, which maybe we should have mentioned in, in, the, in the last one. And again, not, nothing to do. Go ahead and, and do your pruning for building clearance. What do you think, Cara? 
Definitely agree. Only thing I would change is the habitat, uh, high plant species diversity um, to low. Yeah, maybe we're uh, with all of these, obviously we're just looking at one photo, but uh, this one olive in this patio is certainly not high plant species diversity. But regardless of how we but fill this out. Yeah, their overall determination is totally correct. Yeah. So I, I think everyone's doing a great job when I look at these um, pre-work inspection homeworks. There's often some little things that we might change and we can really see how often we're working in areas where in category one areas, right? We're working in low value habitat areas during the non-breeding season. This really isn't going to affect our work very much. It's when we start getting into these higher habitat value areas getting into the breeding season that we wanna be more aware of this, but this is a good time for us to practice because um, we're not gonna make a lot of mistakes right now. Okay, so now we have a pruning of a pine and a eucalyptus in someone's backyard. And so here's the sort of top of the pine tree and here's the base. Uh, full disclosure, I believe this is in Southern California, not Arizona or Nevada, but uh, I did my, did my best to find semi-relevant examples. So we've uh, determined that it is a low value habitat during the non-breeding season. And there's no signs of bird nests or activity. Okay to start work within the next week. Um, I, I'll start out by saying um, this natural backyard habitat up against what appears to be like a desert scrub um, natural area uh, seems like it would be on the higher value to me. I can't, we, again, we only have two photos to work with here, but I'm struck by compared to the other two, this is really much higher habitat value to me. Um, I don't think this would land in your, you know, have to inspect this with a wildlife biologist sort of section car, but where, where would you end up? What, what are you seeing when you look at this? So yeah, like you said, we're not seeing what the whole area looks like. And if this is a backyard and the trimming is kept only within the yard and you're doing it outside of the, the breeding season, then I think that it probably could still fall in that category one, but it's borderline. Um, and certainly if it was the breeding season, you are next door to some better habitat. So it's, it's a little, yeah, it's on the line. Yeah, if I, if I looked at all the work that I do, like the different project areas, this would end up in the higher habitat value for me. And so I would want to do this work during the non-breeding season. And so that's sort of like reverse engineering this system a little bit. But I think that saying, hey, it looks like this is good habitat to make sure we get it done during the non-breeding season. Let's, you know, if it's August, we're going to push it out a month. If it's, uh, you know, uh, March or February, maybe we're going to try to get it done real quick before that really starts. So, you know, I think that it's um, a little bit complicated here, depending on the exact situation. But I think that what I really like about this is down at the advice given, it says, okay to proceed with work. If during planned work, a nest is detected, stop work and contact me, the inspector. I think that's a great note here. And, and important to remember, we don't need to detect all of our wildlife on these pre-work inspections. We can detect them during our work and stop work then and try and back off. What we're really trying to do with the pre-work inspection is minimize some of the costs and difficulties of stopping work in the middle by identifying those nests earlier uh, so that we can plan accordingly. So anyways, great job with your pre-work inspection homework. If we want to, we can look at some more of them um, afterwards, but that's what I have for right now. So let's just do a couple of minutes to wrap up here and everyone can get started thinking about, you know, their questions and discussion because we're going to get into that in just a minute here. What we're really trying to do with these pre-work inspections is identify signs of nesting wildlife and find active nests, right? So we're really concerned about active nests because for most of a bird or wildlife's life, they're quite good at avoiding us. But when they when we have eggs or young in the nest, they're both incredibly vulnerable and uh, stationary, they can't move. And so as we come into their area, we're really quite concerned about the impacts that we might have on them at this stage compared to the adult stage. And Arizona and Nevada, we think, we seem to be seeing that palm trees, especially palm trees with full skirts, seem to be particularly valuable habitat, particularly good nesting sites. 
So remember to spend extra time inspecting those trees if they've got the full skirts, because we think that the likelihood of them having nesting wildlife in there may be higher than some other areas that, that we see, but you know, not, not crazy higher, just, uh, just a, a little bit something to be aware of. And what we really want to do is we wanna be able to complete our work while mom and dad stay there to protect the nest, to keep the young in the nest, to be able to care for them. And so we're trying not to, we're trying to work far enough away or not work at all, leave. leave. Um, the best thing that we can do if we find an active nest is stay away for enough time to allow the young to leave the nest and then go in and do our work. And so that's what we're really trying to do is, is keep our parents there caring for the young at the nest not scaring the young out of the nest and having them on the ground like this raven here. It'd be good if they, better if they can stay on the nest, even though mom was there watching, uh, watching me when I was close to this raven here. So if we think about what's unique about Arizona and Nevada, really we talked about hot, arid conditions. And so this means that our nestlings are often very sensitive to this overheating. And we want to be aware of that in a couple of ways in tree care. We generally wouldn't work in a tree that has a nest in it because we have relatively large buffers. But when we're thinking about, you know, removing vegetation that may be near a future nest or an active nest if it's an emergency situation, we want to make sure that we're maintaining that canopy density to keep these nestlings from overheating, right? So parents will actually, um, you know, incubate the eggs to keep them warm when it's cold and they'll sort of shade the eggs when it's too hot to keep them from overheating. So this can be a really important time if you happen to find an active nest during the warmer months at warmer times of the day, that may be a particularly important time to stay away from the nest or to have a bigger buffer. So that's just something to keep aware of if you're working in one of these warmer regions, including Southern California and other places. And sort of the most difficult situation we're gonna find is when we, are doing work near an active nest and we're not sure whether it's going to impact those wildlife or not. And so this is really what wildlife biologists specialize in. But if we're gonna be pruning a branch near an, an active nest or removing a, a shrub underneath it or something like that, even then we should be staying you know, well away from this nest and waiting until the young have left before we do this work. And again, if it's an absolute emergency, if we have to get this done, that's a good time to contact a wildlife biologist and talk to them about it, maybe get them to come out to the site with you and help you be able to complete the, this project. So we have a range of buffers in our best management practices that rely on you being able to identify the bird at least a little bit. And that um, with a wildlife biologist, probably you can work closer than these uh, suggested buffers they're going to have a lot more details about your specific situation, that specific species, that specific individual to be able to help you complete that project. So contact information for wildlife biologists can be very important and very helpful in, in getting these projects done when you really need to do that, when the timeline is important and you can't wait a couple of weeks for the young to leave the nest. Okay. 